Okay, so as we are winding down our last handful of slides, um, I want to talk about the major criticisms of this whole concept of diagnosing somebody with hypersexual disorder or sex addiction. Um, first of all, as I keep saying again and again, and I can't drum it into your head enough, sex addiction is not a recognized diagnosis. It didn't make it into the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So there's no unifying model or definition for sex addiction. So it's kind of surprising that there are professionals diagnosing it and treating it because it didn't make it into the diagnostic literature. So we have to ask what the ethics of that are, especially since people are getting paid to quote, treat a disorder that has no diagnostic value in the manual for diagnosis. Um, the other issue is the concern that sex addiction and the desire that some people have to make it a classified disorder is really more about moral and societal beliefs and not based on science. And therefore, at present, it's been argued there really is no scientific evidence for such a thing as sex addiction. So we're treating something that doesn't have a scientific basis to support it. The sex addiction industry, and I think I've said this numerous times, the sex addiction industry is very, 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 very profitable. It is a lucrative money-making industry, especially when you have wealthy, famous people all going to these private clinics for sex addiction. Some of these clinics cost thousands, hear me, thousands per day, per day, thousands per day. So we have to ask ourselves, is this really a scientifically driven, medically appropriate diagnostic and treatment plan, or are people profiting from this? And it's nothing more than based on moral and social norms that some people think are appropriate versus not. And meanwhile, we have people profiting from, quote, treating something that has no scientific basis. Um, other concerns surround the argument that the diagnosis of sex addiction takes away personal responsibility. So I'll go back to the celebrities and politicians. Someone like Harvey Weinstein is reported by multiple women for inappropriate sexual behavior that he used to manipulate them given his position in their industry. Is that because of sex addiction or is that just a selfish egomaniac using his power to get the sex he wants to get. The real issue some say is not sex addiction, but in fact other underlying issues that do have diagnostic and significant scientific basis, such as personality disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, substance use disorders, impulse control disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder spectrum. So they argue, and I'm going to get to that on the next slide in a minute, but the argument is we don't need sex addiction as a category because when people engage in sexual behavior in ways that thwart their well-being in some form, it's usually because they are associated with an existing disorder. We don't need this sex addiction category because most people who engage in sex in ways that are problematic for their well-being or the well-being of others already have a clinical diagnosis that has scientific value, and that behavior is an outgrowth of those untreated disorders. Um, and I'm going to talk about those on the next slide in a minute. Patrick Carnes, the individual whose segment I asked you to watch at the beginning of this lecture, because he's a big sex addiction supporter who, by the way, has profited widely, extensively to treat this disorder in some famous folks. Um, he's the one who brought the notion of sexual addiction to light in the 1980s. Ready for this one, guys? He is not a trained therapist or even trained in the science of human sexuality. In fact, get ready for this one. In fact, most of his training is in organizational behavior and counselor education. He's an IO psychologist, industrial organizational. Those folks study the way people interact in teams and groups. They most often work with 
corporate environments to increase productivity, increase group cohesion, and help management be more effective in their leadership. What in the fucking world does that have to do with human sexuality or treating sex addiction? Zero. Zero, 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 zero. He knows a lot about business, though. What a lucrative way to find yourself a money-making idea. Hmm? Think about it. Um, so I want you to think about the fact that the main individual who advanced this concept forward, a concept that has no scientific basis, that has not been accepted in the clinical diagnostic nomenclature or diagnostic manual, this individual is not even trained in the area he is speaking about. So let's move on to slide number 18. What are the comorbid um, disorders that we often see in people who have what has been called by some hypersexual behavior or sex addiction? Comorbid, remember, means a person has more than one disorder or problem happening simultaneously. So what is called sex addiction or hypersexuality has been associated with affect dysregulation. So we mean people who have difficulty regulating their emotional states, depression and anxiety. Often when people are depressed or anxious, they're using sexual behavior to self-medicate their mood state. Impulsivity or impulse control disorders, where I've talked a lot about what that means already in this lecture, People who act without conscious reflection just to feel good, just to have arousal. They're not consciously thinking about why they're doing it. They're just acting because of an immediate gratification. Um, in addition, loneliness is often a reason that people engage in excessive, excessive, quote, sexual activity. Low self-esteem or low self-worth, they feel better about themselves either if people want them or they don't feel good about themselves, so they let people use them for sex. Insecure attachment styles, people who in childhood, for example, had parents with whom they felt insecure, didn't feel loved, or sometimes felt protected and loved, and other times didn't. So they use sex as a way to bond and to deal with their anxiety about abandonment. Um, personal distress, where they're having problems in their lives that are causing stress, and this is a way to alleviate their stress, to have sex. Risk-taking behavior, so promiscuity is just another form of risk-taking, and often these people are also engaging in substance abuse and other risk-taking activities. Um, and self-hatred and shame. They don't think well of themselves. They think that they're sinful. They think that they're bad people. So they almost have the sex as a punishment. However, I do want to mention that although many of these things have been associated with what's called sex addiction by some, it's not always the case that, quote, hypersexuality or excessive sexual behavior is associated with um, psychological distress. It is sometimes, but not always. That is not always the case. I just want to point that out. Okay, I will see you on slide number 19, our last content slide before we go to class business. See you soon.